have been doing this meetup. One is um, open, everyone can join, like uh, the format that we have today. And the other is a bit of a closed format where we allow 15 people, 15 to 20 people, and till now it's only students to come over to our office and have a, have a meetup. So I'm gonna talk about both those. So let me start with our mission. So we're at a time, we're at a dawn of an era where we, we're about to see three big disruption that we have unprecedented disruption that autonomous, uh, automotive industry has ever experienced. So one of them is electrification of vehicles. So we will see electrif electrified vehicles uh, we, 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 we have seen it and we'll see more and more. We will see connected vehicles. So connected vehicles uh, will be more and more common in our, in our time. And finally, the most important one is autonomous vehicles. So in this time, we, when we're, we're, we're at a dawn of an era where we see this unprecedented change, we wanted to start a dialogue. This is our first mission. We want to start a dialogue. And Meetup Group is one very good way to start such dialogue. Other than the Meetup Group, we also do a podcast, uh, which is available in YouTube, Anchor, iTunes, Google, Spotify, and all the channels. So this is also a part of our dialogue mission. We, we continue that and I really appreciate your participation. The second uh, reason, of the second part of our mission is to build a community. So we have seen our time, the power of community. We have seen, uh, like uh, Robert Krishna already mentioned, that we're, we have 11,000 tribes around the world and we're, so for the first time in the history of mankind, we're all connected. So we have 7.8 billion people and we can do fantastic things by building a community. So let me continue a little bit with, the, with, the, with the one who was inspired to build a community. Um, I'll start with this question. Can anybody recognize this? This is a 14,500 years old stone that was, uh, that was discovered by the archaeologists in Chile. And what's fascinating, this is, this is one kind of a weapon they used to fight all day. What's, fa what's fascinating is very much like something that we use in our time. It's not the cell phone I'm referring to, but very close to it. It's not that more the one I'm referring to. Can anybody tell me what am I referring to that we use today? That size of the human pump? Yes? A mouse. A mouse, fantastic. So a mouse. So there is a, there is a really spooky um, similarity between these two, but there is a big difference in terms of the manufacturing process. What is the big difference in terms of the manufacturing process? What am I trying to refer to? Maybe it's what one is following and one is built. Absolutely. What I'm trying to say is more about the process. We come from the automotive industry, we talk about the process. One, one person could go and get, get the stone from the nature and single handedly craft this weapon. But there is not a single person in this planet Earth who can say that I can. Uh, manufacture a mouse on my own. There is not a company out there who can say I can manufacture a mouse on my own without my suppliers. It, and it is not an exaggeration to say there is not a single country who can say I can, I can manufacture a mouse without importing things. Probably the, probably the assembly code was written in, in the US, the, the chip was manufactured in China, and who knows where it was assembled. So we are living in a time that we can do literally nothing on our own. And that's what differentiates our species from any other species. That's why we stand out. Our ability to collaborate in a, in a large number. So this is, the, this is our, my second mission. And I could never express this other than the word Ubuntu, the South African word that we know for a Linux version for, I am because we are, the spirit of community. And we also collaborate with other communities, other groups. Here is another one example, uh, the Detroit Autonomous Vehicle Group. We collaborate with them, and they are really doing cool stuff. They're building, uh, building autonomous vehicles uh, on their own. So the next meetup. The next meetup would be uh, the closed event again. So I'm going to, this is, this is for students. How many of you are, are actually students here? So 
Uh, we'll take only 15 people for a cup per serve, and we'll have coffee together and discuss how to bootstrap a tech company. This is a little bit of a different topic, as how to bootstrap a tech company without venture capital. So you're welcome to join Kai. Our colleague Kai will put uh, the, the meetup in the meetup group, and you'll be able to register. Hi. So finally, to join Kai. Our colleague Kai will put uh, the, the meetup in the meetup group, and you'll be able to register. Hi. Thank you very much, Hassan. So Yeah, so as Hassan already said, the second the meetup group is called Being Human with Algorithms, in German, Mensch sein mit Algorithmen. And this is an action that I started last year together with the German chapter of the ACM. So who of you knows what the ACM is? Okay, I won't be surprised if, okay, if you know it. So it's the Association of Computing for Computing Machinery, and it's the biggest professional organization for computer related people. So the special thing about the ACM, so maybe you heard about the German Computer Society, the GE, Gesellschaft für Informatik, and so the ACM is combining the professionals and the academic people, while the GE is a little bit more dominated by the academic people. So these are the two major societies. The GE in Germany is much bigger, but worldwide the ACM is the big thing that is on globally available there. Okay, and then I'm with the German chapter, and last year we turned 50, this year the GE turns 50, and we thought about, okay, what do we do for our year to celebrate it, and we created an initiative that transports something that is very important for me personally, and also for the mission of the German chapter of the ACM, namely discussing with the people about how technology evolves. So Hassan was already talking about a little bit that we have a technology-dominated world, and the thing that is currently happening, probably you heard about the term digital transformation. For me, this mainly means that when you do something today, the probability that algorithms and software are involved is quite high. And so you can do almost nothing without interacting with an algorithm. And while many of you are probably technicians, so you are creating such kind of systems, while we are creating such systems, other people have to use it or to use them. And there are lots of implications. And so with this thing here, with this activity, we want to foster the dialogue, not only with computer scientists or computer technical people, but with the society as la at large. So there are more people coming in, very good. Yeah, and uh, last year, last year we had the symposium under the same name and uh, Just uh, get the people seated. Yeah, and so last year we turned 50 and I, I was the main organizer for a symposium there. And uh, maybe you know some of the, uh, oh, sorry. Maybe you know some of the people that are shown here. So this is Windsurf, so one of the two people who created the original internet, who's very active there. Um, then you might know this one here, it's Martin Hellman. So this is one of the two guys who created the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is the thing that you use every day when you access an HTTPS website. And uh, yeah, we had, we had more Turing Award winners. The other people are also very interested. interesting. If you want to know more, you can go to our website as well. Um, I want to say briefly something to the motto. So what does it mean being human with algorithms? And there are some questions that you can ask yourself there, namely, okay, what is it, this digital transformation? When is it happening? Where is it happening? Who should think about it or who's participating? And why should I care? And so the answers are quite simple. So it's happening now, it's happening everywhere, so you will not f find a place on the earth or rarely find a place where you don't have to do with this digital transformation. Who should care or who's involved? Everybody is involved. And why should I care? Because if you're a creator, you have a responsibility. And if you're not a creator, but someone using the technology, then you should get into dialogue with those people creating the technology because 
currently your future is getting shaped. And at the moment we are at a point in time where we can still define things. Once they are rolled out, it's very difficult to take them back. I will also come to that a little bit in my talk later. Okay, so... That's a very tricky question. I am an engineer, right? And uh, I tend to see the world as it's full of algorithms. So there's been always an algorithm up there. They just changed in the, in the shape some generations ago. It was just for the first surf in the leap. But nowadays, everybody is using applications like Uber, like Tinder, Deliveroo, whatever. It will eventually bring many, many benefits for the generations to come. Okay, so this is a former student of mine who is running a startup and also organizing the startup community in Barcelona. And so he was very well <laughs> talking about what this, what this digital transformation and being human with algorithms means. Namely, most of the applications you use in day-to-day -day life are digital applications, are software that you interact with. An iconic picture that I always love to show here is the Pope election. So maybe you saw these pictures before. So this is the Pope election in 2005, and this is the Pope election in 2013. <laughs> and it shows very well what this digital transformation is, because what we see in the lower picture is everybody has a smartphone, and they are making a photo with it. And in 2005, people didn't have that. And when you think about when you used your smartphone last, and what happens when you forget it at home, and then you know how much this digital transformation changed our lives already. Okay, so... Um, when we looked at, okay, digital transformation, what is this? We thought about how can we look at the field? So what is affected there? And we try to structure it a little bit. And of course, we have the technology, then we have the work life, we have education, we have ethics. There's also something important that I will cover later in the talk. We have the society, we also have art, we have governance, we have law and order, and we have many more aspects. But this helps already to see, okay, everything is affected by it. This is the overview of the symposium we had. The talks are not yet online, but will be online also soon on the website. And so this is also very interesting to look at because all had to say something very interesting. So maybe I point out one more person. So this one here is Peter Weibel, and he's running the Zentrum für Kunst und Medien in Karlsruhe, which is a center for contemporary and also media art. And so he was pointing out that also the art was changing a lot through the digital processes. Okay. So this was a symposium. These were our participants there. It happened in Heidelberg. And so this year at 11th of November, I guess, we will have another edition of the symposium together with the um, Stuttgarter Zukunft Symposium. So this will be in Stuttgart, obviously, then. So if you're interested in that, also have a look at the website. And uh, yeah, at the event, we had different Turing Award winners. So to the Turing Award is like the Nobel Prize for computer science. And so these are the people that were selected by the ACM and they got the prize and a different of them participated. So Martin Hellman, and this is Whitfield Diffie. So the second one of the Diffie Hellman Key Exchange was quite fun to interact with these people. So it was quite nice meeting them. And the others you might also have heard of. Okay, then I just brought you some impressions from the event. So this is uh, Windsurf and uh, Whitfield Diffie here and then this one here is Martin Hellman and uh, Bob Targen here. And here you actually see some of the art exhibition pieces because I managed to convince the ZKM to bring some exhibition pieces to Heidelberg. This was also very impressive. So this is again Windsurf and Bob Targen there. And uh, this is another piece here. And uh, yeah, so this, this was a symposium there. And uh, yeah, that brings me already to the last slide. So like Hassan has, we also have lots of activities there. And so, of course, we have the meetup group. So you also find it on the flyer. And then we also have the website. So on the website, we have a blog where one of my aims is, so how to narrow down this digital transformation? Well, my approach is to interview interesting people. And so I also interviewed Hassan. So the interview will also hopefully be available very soon. So on the weekend, I actually want to cut some of the videos. and. I have at the moment about like 20 videos there with interesting people, also with the Turing Award winners. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, have a look there. Um, we also have a LinkedIn and a Facebook group and also a Twitter group here. Okay. Last but not least, 
Um, the current chairman of the German chapter of the ACM asked me to also announce something that is related to today, namely they are organizing a conference, the ACM Computer Science in Cars Symposium, and if you are in research, then the submission deadline is still open. If not, it might also be an interesting place to see current research related maybe also to topics that we're talking about today. Okay, so much about the symposium. By the way, if you've never been in Heidelberg, this is how it looks there, so it's beautiful. This is a view from the castle. I highly recommend you to go there. Okay, so that was it for the introduction, and uh, then I hand over to Hassan again. Thank you, Mark. So um, our first speaker is uh, Stephen Norton, a colleague of mine. So I will tell a little bit about Stephen. Stephen has worked for both the uh, Bavarian, two of the Bavarian OEMs. He has more than 12, 13 years of experience in automotive. He's a functional safety expert. You know, and all his credentials are there. Besides this credential, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my personal opinion on Stephen. Uh, Stephen is one of those guys that fascinates me because of his approach towards solving problems. So when I, I've learned so much from Stephen, obviously about safety, technical things, but his approaches, how he approaches problem. I remember once we went to a customer and we were doing some safety consultancy and we, uh, actually Stephen literally solved their six months of system engineering in half a day. So I'm so much fascinated by the way he works and I've learned so much from him. So Stephen, I'm so glad to have you as my friend. St please, a big welcome for Stephen. Is it working? Yeah, I just need to switch this around. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Hassan. So I'm delighted to have been invited to talk to you today about creating safe architectures. Hassan already mentioned we have these disruptive forces, electrification, autonomy, and communication. A common misconception is that commercial aircraft have up to quadruplex redundancy of the intended function for safety. Actually, aircraft only have duplex redundancy for safety. The additional levels of failure tolerance are added for convenience and economic reasons. Put simply, the airlines do not like having unscheduled maintenance breakdowns. And I think the future of autonomous driving will be similar. Customers will not accept vehicles that break down frequently or require unscheduled maintenance. I think a minor failure should not even be noticeable to the user and even a major failure should not prevent the journey from being continued. So let me take a basic example. We have a road vehicle. We need to steer the vehicle. The classical electrical power steering implements safety measures to prevent hazards such as self-steer and blocking of the steering. If the vehicle is light enough to be steered by hand, then the safety measure is simply to turn off the steering assist. However, on a heavier vehicle, a sudden loss of steering assist itself may be a hazard. So in that case, a more complicated safety mechanism is necessary. For example, if we're using a three-phase motor 
to perform the steering assist, then the safety mechanism must be able to detect which of the three phases has the problem and isolate that one phase, but then continue to provide some residual, minimal level of torque assist using the two remaining phases with all the problems of asymmetry uh, that go along with that. The point is we can then use that to get the vehicle safely to the side of the road, or if we're in a curve, to exit the curve and stop the vehicle. So that's what you can see on the slides behind me. We've got the good old traditional, we go straight back to the black box, human, or on a big vehicle, we go to the red box to enable us to stop the vehicle safely, and then we're broken down. Now, by definition, vehicle does not have a driver. So there is no manual mode. Now, I know the SAE levels only go to five. I personally wish we had a level six, defined as being no control whatsoever. So let's just imagine for the sake of argument for tonight, we have a fictitious level six where the driver uh, cannot even take over. So the vehicle must provide sufficient redundancy safely stop the vehicle in lane in all possible driving scenarios. However, we are introducing many electronic systems with unintended interactions into the vehicle. The probability of a single failure is increasing. But it is not going to be acceptable if the first failure immediately leads to an, an emergency stop and break down in lane, for example, on the motorway. So, we need to consider the user cases for a fully autonomous vehicle. For example, consumers of alcoholic beverages, businessmen sleeping en route, elderly, infirm or disabled persons, young children being sent to school or picked up from school, so in these user cases, we really need to avoid a breakdown on the motorway. That means we need somehow to have a capability to limp to a safe location. Not just limp to the side of the road, but to be able to limp to a safe location, such as the next motorway services. This means we need what I'm calling a failure architecture. Now in the orange box we're seeing a degradation mode. In this degradation mode we can compromise on comfort and on performance. We're assuming it doesn't happen very often, so the steering doesn't need to be smooth or precise. We can choose to limit the vehicle speed to, for example, just 30 kilometers per hour, which would be sufficient for the car to limp along the breakdown lane, the hard shoulder. But again, we're back down to breakdowns and limpings, and that's not really a very nice product. So if we're considering what I would call a middle class of car, the owners or the passengers do not want to suffer an interruption to their journey because of a single failure. So we need a failure tolerant, fail operational architecture. So we're now going to introduce degradation mode X. We're going to say that we can compromise on performance, but not on comfort. The compromise on performance could be, for example, that we limit the maximum speed to 90 kilometers per hour. So for anybody that's awake to see it, we could put up a yellow warning light and we need to inform somebody that there's unscheduled maintenance necessary. But we then design the vehicle architecture to ensure that it is safe to continue driving in this mode, up until it's convenient for us to give the car in for a service. Now let's take this a step further. 
German automotive industry, we're famous worldwide for our premium cars. So let's be clear, if we're talking about selling someone a BMW 7 Series, an Audi A8, a Mercedes S-Class, or a Volkswagen Bentley, then customers will simply not be happy if failures lead regularly to performance limitations and unscheduled maintenance. Therefore, we need to design the architecture so that even minor failures can be tolerated without any operational limitation. This minor failure will not be announced. Just as in the aviation industry, the failure will be stored in a maintenance log and fixed at the next scheduled service. After a second failure in the same system, a performance limitation is acceptable. So then we limit the vehicle to 90 kilometers per hour. The comfort is retained. The vehicle continues to operate safely. Journeys can continue to be made on all types of road, including motorway, highway, interstate. But of course, an unscheduled maintenance appointment is necessary. Then when we get down to the third failure, a very rudimentary control could be implemented to enable the vehicle to limp to the nearest exit or service station. So the journey cannot be continued. We would limit maybe the maximum speed to 30 kilometers per hour. And the rudimentary steering might just be 10 degrees left, zero, 10 degrees right. That might be sufficient, such a rudimentary control. And then if we get the fourth failure, the vehicle must be brought to an immediate stop in the lane. So to achieve four levels of failure tolerance for the steering, we need three steering actuators. So I've put these here, the steering actuators are the blue circles at the top of the screen, one, E, and two. So if one and two, that's the primary and secondary steering packs are operational, we have complete performance and comfort. If either the primary or the secondary, so one of them fails, we have the degradation mode and must reduce the speed. If both the primary and the secondary steering fails, we can limp along the breakdown lane at up to 30 kilometers per hour using the emergency steering. And if that fails, differential braking can be used to keep the vehicle in the breakdown lane during the emergency The same approach works for the power train in the red circles. I, I hope there's nobody who's red, green, blue color here. So, um, it's one, two, and three in the case of the red circles. So we've got two motors on the rear axle and a third motor on the front axle. So if we have all three motors, we have complete com comfort and performance. If one motor fails, that means we have less, less power available. So we may need to reduce the speed. If two motors fail, we can still limp back down to that 30 kilometers per hour along the breakdown lane. And if the third motor fails, we're going to stop, and we've got the brakes and the steering to stop us safely. So to achieve these levels of failure tolerance, it requires not only changes to the design and architecture of the respective items, the vehicle energy source needs to support this as well. So in my proposed architecture, I'm showing that we can have two high voltage DC buses and two low voltage DC buses. So the point here is if a short circuit occurs on one bus, the second bus is sufficient con to continue the journey. We have the same in the aviation industry, two engines, two hydraulic systems, green hydraulic system, yellow hydraulic system. So this is a well-tested and demonstrated concept for a safe modular architecture. And then we could divide the battery up 
into four quarters. Because when we're talking about the batteries we need for electric vehicles, we're talking about capacity. I don't think we need to worry about voltage. So we don't need one long battery to get a really high voltage. We can actually just structure this battery into four quarters. So if one quarter fails, or its associated battery management system fails, we just disconnect it from the electrical bus. And the remaining quarter battery can supply that electrical bus. So both buses remain fully functional. But of course, we reduce the range of the vehicle by a quarter. And if both high voltage DC buses fail, then we can still perform an emergency stop in the lane with the steering and the braking fed by the low voltage only. So having achieved sufficient failure tolerance for the autopilot computers, the steering, braking, powertrain, and electrical supply, the most interesting challenge, of course, it's the sensor. So I'm proposing a, a reference architecture where sensors can be added and moved in a modular fashion. The challenge will be to evaluate the level of performance achieved for each of those configurations. And unfortunately, this is one of the dilemmas. In simple terms, the idea is that it, for example, may be sufficient to have only one long-range radar sensor. Because we can show if the one long-range sensor fails, we can design the vehicle to continue to operate safely using the medium-range sensors. But we go into that first degradation mode where we reduce the speed to maybe just 90 kilometers per hour. And if the medium range sensor fails, then we go to our second degradation mode where we limp up the breakdown lane at 30 kilometers per hour and we could maybe rely just on camera, optical camera and LIDAR to maintain the safety. The aim of the architecture is to achieve both sufficient safety and reliability without having multiple redundancies of every sensor type. So I hope I've given you a bit of an introduction to this architecture, reference architecture, part of what I'm proposing. Yes, the sensors would be the most interesting bit, so over the next three years I will be delving, uh, uh, delving more deeply into that topic and uh, look forward to hearing from with your questions now and maybe also in the future as you progress with your work in this field and get some feedback and maybe you have some interest in actually applying uh, the reference model and some of the research we'll be doing. So that's my initial statement and now I think the idea is that we should get into a discussion uh, based on some of the ideas. minutes for Q&A. Mm -hmm. So please feel free to ask questions. If you're watching in a live stream, you can type your questions and we will entertain your questions. Just one question. Why do you need low voltage batteries? Because we assume that in this situation the car is still running. Mm -hmm. So why don't we assume that one of the electric motors would be a uh, energy source? Mm -hmm. It would be a one of the possible options, definitely. Um, from the aviation perspective, we're looking at the two primary high voltage DC networks as being similar to having the two engines running, which run on fuel. When they fail, we still, on the aircraft, have our 28 volt batteries as the DC emergency bus. So there's this segregation between the primary energy sources, and if they go wrong, having some simple low power segregated network. Um, there's but nothing in principle. Like the in the car, sure. The wheel, right. And even in the aircraft, of course, if we lose both engines, we can, in theory, pop out 
a ram air turbine which drives the blue hydraulic system and use that to drive an electrical generator, but that can fail as well. So this is about the ensuring how we're done uh, for tolerance. And I think I would be uncomfortable um, if we were to rely on generating the power because we have to look at the fault tree and the dependent fault analysis. If we're driving with one electrical bus or we fail, that means we're relying on the second electrical bus to carry on driving safely. If that then happens a major failure while we're driving, then we have a common cause between the failure and the sudden unavailability of our emergency stop system. So this is why I'm proposing having uh, a third uh, DC essential. In fact, we have two DC buses. Because if one fails, I still have the other. Um, and what I'm saying, though, is we only need two high voltage batteries with lots of capacity, or two networks with, with lots of capacity. Uh, the low voltage is pretty small capacity. It's not like the Dreamliner where they drive for as many hours as it takes to get to either hit the water or the nearest airport and keep all the flight controls working on 28 volts. We have the advantage. If we have a big emergency, we pull to the side of the road and stop the vehicle. So we don't need a lot of electrical capacity in our low voltage batteries. Um, but I believe for failure tolerance, uh, we do need, I think, two low voltage systems. Any other questions? OK, if there is no more questions, yes. Uh, Microphone, please. <laughs> so uh, to, be, to ask it a, a bit more seriously, uh, who do you think would still decide uh, for the quality of such an architecture? Would it be the OEMs themselves? Would it be a regulator? Mm -hmm. Who would uh, drive towards uh, such a high level of security? Mm -hmm. I think the first comment I would make about the automotive industry everything other than the disruptive forces of new startups like Elon Musk. So if we talk about the industry, we have to be blunt about this. We cannot be complacent. Um, complacency is what got Boeing in the 737 MAX mess, and before that in the lithium-ion battery mess with the Dreamliner that was the previous aircraft that got grounded while in service. So frankly, what the automotive industry, the classic OEMs are doing, is modifying step by step their existing architectures, but because they're just either too big, too old, or too inflexible to have a big new architecture, my perception is that they're just chipping away. Everybody's trying to do a little bit, but there's nobody there to come and do something big and new. So I'm not confident we will see uh, a classical OEM take on this new architecture, unless Somebody at the top says, hang on a minute, folks, let's learn from the 737 MAX. Let's stop trying to um, bodge the old architectures and start with a clean sheet design. And so that's the research I'm doing because I personally wanted to start on a clean sheet because it's more interesting, it's more fun, and it's an engineering challenge. On the other hand, you've got startups and Elon Musk and Tesla are the other extreme where they're simply putting out functionality. And I think we have to make a clear distinction between safety, security, and functionality. I think they're designing a car that works. But to be blunt, for the most of the industry, and especially the established players, it's not sufficient just to have a car that works occasionally. That's not the reliability that people expect. And we need it safe. That means we need to design the vehicle such that it cannot do what it should do. And, and this is the big challenge. So <clears throat> to come back to your question, I don't think the classical OEMs, unless somebody at the top makes a big decision, will have a revolution. I don't necessarily think some of the startups will provide the revolution either. But uh, with the help of universities and experts working in different companies, if we can create this modular architecture, then we have a roadmap to get us there step by step. And so I don't think we need a big bang approach, but if we can show what works 
to give the reliability customers expect while demonstrating safety and security, then we have a way forwards. But we need to present that way forwards and get people on board. Um, can I use? Can yes. I ask something? Yes, yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Can I have the microphone? Thank you. Um, so you made the comparison to the airline industry, and so there we have lots of certification, and mm -hmm. it's very difficult to introduce innovations. And mm -hmm. so Elon Musk was doing the opposite for the car industry. He was company and eventually also creating a car for sure. the smartphone. Mm -hmm. So. To, to safety there, mm -hmm. would you say we need more certification for these cars, for the autonomous driving? Um, would that help? I'm not sure we have a problem, to be honest. If we look at the aviation industry, they're not so good as we thought. If we look at the disaster of the FAA at the moment, and I think disaster is putting it politely, but since one likes broadcasters, where was please? But I mean, it's just embarrassing, frightening, lots of expletives. Um, that they're self-certifying at Boeing is just a nightmare. So we can be lucky in the automobile industry. We have homologation. We have the TUF. We're not doing quite that level of certification on certain critical aspects. So I don't think we need even more certification than we already have. I would also say uh, the airline and the aviation industry doesn't lack innovation. Uh, we've seen the move to plastic airframes or less metal airframes that weigh less anyway. We've seen, even if it was a bit of a, a bumpy start, introducing lithium-ion technology uh, to reduce the weight of batteries on the Dreamliner. We've seen the Dreamliner drop the pneumatic system, what used to use bleed air out of the compressors of the engine. So it was the first in-service aircraft to no longer use pneumatic bleeds, but have, the, for example, the entire air conditioning system and the engine start system being pure electric. And I think we're seeing so much innovation, we're going to see all electric aircraft very soon, maybe a hybrid to begin with. Um, but we have the motor technology. Uh, we have the battery technology. I think it's just too expensive and too heavy, but that's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the fundamental concept is a problem. Uh, so I don't see the certification or the safety as a problem. It's just a case of moving where we are now to where we could be how long it's going to take. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So um, we'll take one last question. This is a question yeah. from, the, from someone who's watching us uh, in live stream. OK. Hi. Jan Reich from um, Fraunhofer ISSE Research Institute mm -hmm. in Kaiserslautern. Mm -hmm. So his question, I'm not sure if I understood the question right. Sensor redundancy adequacy requires pursuance that failure-related perception are Mm -hmm. Come on. are known and can be properly detected. Based on which methods would you demonstrate adequacy assurance claim? Well, I've got a quick answer, of course. Uh, the colleagues in Kaiserslautern have written a paper on it, so we should probably <laughs> just reference their paper <laughs> and say, great work, guys, and let's do that. Um, so I won't pretend I've got a better answer than they have at the moment. Um, but I, I mentioned that SOTIF dilemma. Mm -hmm. And we haven't fixed the SOTIF dilemma yet. So when we talk about safety, ISO 26262, we are still formally only talking about a failure of the electronics, either a systematic failure in the design or the software or the hardware, but, or alternatively, a random failure of the hardware. We still don't know how good the sensor needs to be. There, and I don't think there's a way for us to internationally define that. So we cannot say we need to detect an object of a certain cross-section at a certain distance in a certain type of weather. What I think we do need, though, is to apply a safety management process where the company creating the vehicle, manufacturing the vehicle, decides for themselves a set of scenarios where they say, OK, that's the scenarios we believe are realistic, so that can be verified maybe certification, as you mentioned before, maybe some independent body to check the scenarios are plausible and sufficient. And then we can measure the sensor performance against that scenario catalog and then say, OK, we believe that that's good enough. Now, unfortunately, until we have legislation and ethics legislation and some way of defining how we measure and checking that we're achieving our own targets in real time on the vehicle, then, of course, this is a big legal risk. And I'm not a lawyer, standard disclaimer, I can't give legal advice. But what we have to watch out for in all of these great ideas 
is the product liability because when somebody gets injured, there's no longer a car driver but a manufacturer. And we as engineers have to think about not only getting the product to work and doing our best to make sure it doesn't hurt anybody, but we need a solution, and I think that's politics uh, need to deal with this more than the engineers, to be blunt. We need a solution that when somebody gets injured, how we as society deal with it. Because we know from the aviation industry, putting safety features into aircraft has reduced the number of accidents. Being able to investigate every accident without prosecuting the pilots has definitely encouraged the ability to learn from those mistakes so we make less mistakes the next time round. That was a positive cycle in the aviation industry. I fear we will not be able to repeat that kind of success in the automotive industry. And, and therefore, we need, we need a different approach. And I, I can't give the answer yet what that different approach will be. Um, but the engineers, if we give the task to the engineers today, we need to measure sensor performance in real time and we need a benchmark, and I'll leave it up to somebody else to define how good that benchmark needs to be ethically. But we as engineers, we need to come up with the measuring equipment and, and the real-time feedback to say, are we sufficiently safe or is it foggy? Let's slow down just like the human would do. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, thanks very much. so hard in his academic field. He's a, he's a, he's a natural born hustler and he, he works so hard. I've never seen anyone working that, that hard. I mean, he pushes beyond, beyond any, any limits. So please welcome Mark Oliver Park. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hassan. So I will introduce Hassan afterwards and I can tell you that he's also working incredibly hard. And uh, yeah, so I want to draw our attention to a different topic and uh, I changed the title a little bit here and here it says privacy or why should I care? Okay, so um, yeah, as Hassan already said, I'm at TUM and uh, why do I show the slide? Some of the people here are actually also in the room that are on the picture. Um, because we're doing one thing that I also have on the next slide, which is this one here. And uh, this is a massive open online course on how the internet works. So who knows, who does not know what a massive open online course is? Who knows what a open online, massive open online course is? Okay, so it's, it's an educational training that you can do entirely in the internet. And the internet is the backbone of this digital transformation. If you would not have the connectivity through the internet technology, then nothing could be implemented or almost nothing could be implemented of what we have today. When we think about the autonomous driving, for instance, you always have a back end where you send something to you and then you get some information from there and so on. And therefore, telling the people how this internet works is also a, something that is deep in my heart that I want to know everybody to know this. And this is a course that will start at the beginning of June and uh, you're all cordially invited to participate, it's free. And uh, yeah, we'll start in June and will be about six weeks with four to six hours per week that you should invest there. So it's not too much time investment and it's a lot of fun as you can already see on the picture. Okay, but now let's come to the talk. 
So the key message that I want to convey in this talk, so I don't want to build a climax there, I tell you the message right from the beginning. So the key message is, think about the ethical consequences before you release code. Okay. So this is my statement, so this is what you should take home from the talk. So when we talk about ethics, let's first have a look at what ethics is. And so a reliable source in that sense, that it's made by the people, so this is also something that the digital transformation enabled, is here Wikipedia, so in science you should not necessarily cite it, but it's giving a good definition. So it says, ethics seeks to resolve questions of human morality by defining concepts such as good and evil, right and wrong, virtue and vice, justice and crime. Okay, so in a nutshell, it means it's about you and your relation to society. So how do we want to, to have the environment in which we live? So what shall we do and what shall we rather not do because we do not want anyone else to do it to us? Okay, so next thing you might ask is, okay, but what do I have to do with this? Well, so there the answer is also easy. When we look at how our work life looked like, looked like in uh, 1900, then it was like manual labor. When we look at how our work life looks today, then it more looks like this. So hopefully you're also that enthusiastic when you're working. So the key item here is the computer. So most of our jobs have to do with the computer. And as many of you will be people who create something with this computer, you have a certain responsibility, as I also said at the beginning. And seeing that the computers have such an important role here brings us to one insight, namely software algorithms rule the world. Okay, so think about it a second. So software algorithms rule the world. So why did I write that? So when you think about your washing machine, for instance, when you bought a washing machine 20 years ago, you had a mechanical control. When you buy one today, it has a software control that is running there on a chip. And this is the case for many, many things that we have today, that everything switched from hardware control to software control. The smartphone is again a very good example. So there you have everything at your fingertip on this phone and you can start all the software and everything on there. And as it's shifting to software, of course, all the problems with software are coming because the good thing with software is you can update it. The bad thing with software is that you can prematurely ship it. And this is what is happening sometimes. Okay. So what or where could we be evil when we create such software? So what I want to look at next is the, a data processing pipeline. So what happens? Where is the software actually happening when we look at autonomous driving? And the first thing we have is we have some data sources. So it's not only autonomous driving, but it's also something that we are typically working with in the research as well, namely the smart home, the smartphones, you have some surveillance cameras, and of course, you have cool electric cars that you're driving around that bring you some levels of autonomy, for instance, but definitely bring you some assistance that are in these cars. Okay, and so these things here have something in common, namely they are observing their environment, but by observing their environment, they're observing you because you can be in the environment or you're in the car, and then you're also getting observed potentially. Okay, so here we see a Waymo car, and uh, yeah, so it's driving around and it's sensing the environment. And it can use different technologies for that. So here it's definitely using a LiDAR, but it can also use a camera for instance. And what do we have on the processing pipeline now? Well, we have some processing. And so the processing here is happening on the car. Okay, necessary because we have to do something on this car. And what are we doing? So we are running some algorithms. So here, for instance, we see a bike driver here and the car will show us now. So this is the view of the car. So actually it's the view of the algorithm of the model that is inside the software there. And what is it doing so that the car is not running over this bike driver? So we see the actions here 
And here we also see the camera image on the bottom left. Here we see the bike driver. And yeah, let's see what it does. Okay, so it nicely slows down. So it does what we hope for. Okay. And this shows us already, okay, the person who programmed this algorithm had a responsibility, namely to identify the bike driver and to slow down when the bike driver comes. So if these people would not have done it consciously, they could also have done a software that runs over somebody. Okay, good. Let's go back to the Waymo car here. So let's continue the drive. And so here we see now already processing. So we see different objects that are recognized here and different properties that are assigned to these objects. And this is important because this step goes far beyond just recording the environment, but it's understanding the environment. And so the car here now sees, okay, there are some pedestrian walks, there are other objects, there are traffic lights, the cars have different speeds, it has a model and anticipates what the cars are doing, how fast they are going. And when I see this, I think like, wow, so this is really something new. So maybe five years ago or even three years ago, we were far away from having this deployed. And so the development came very fast. And so the algorithms are really capable of understanding things there, which is good, of course, because otherwise we could not do the autonomous driving there. Okay. Last example here is the Tesla. So this is interesting because this shows us also the many cameras that we have here. And the cameras are interesting because they're image data. And with image data, we can also do lots of things. So this is just a Tesla ride. As we've seen, it also acted quite well. So this is very good. And we do not only have cameras to the outside, but we can also have cameras to the inside. So this here is a driver of a lorry and this driver is getting monitored. And on the left here, you see different performance parameters of this driver. And the idea behind here is to check that the driver is not falling asleep and then warning the driver. Okay, positive use case, good. Okay, so we see with software, we can do many things. So we only need a limited set of sensors. So cameras, for instance, are a good sensors. And then we can do lots of applications. We can even put more applications later. So if you want to know if this driver is happy, it's very easy. You just have to change a few parameters in the software and you will be able to know that. Okay, good. So we have local processing working quite well. Okay, what happens next typically? Well, next the data is coming out of the car to somewhere else. Okay, it's coming to a data center. Okay, that's interesting, good. So data is coming from here, getting stored. But this is an important step because what is happening now is that we are crossing a border. So before we had things locally, so we had data on our side, so it was within our car. So we could define like that the data is with us. So we, we were the owners of the data at that point in time. And now it's going out of the car. It's going to someone else. And this will definitely be the car manufacturer, for instance, because the car manufacturer wants to have some performance data and so on, but it could be more data that is going out there. Okay, so then someone has some data. Okay, why not? You might have heard that a data is the new oil. So it's not this oil, but it's rather this oil. And uh, what does this saying mean? So it means that it's a highly valuable resource. Okay, so the, the company with the, with the faces in the books is storing a lot of data for a longer time or some national agencies are also doing that. And what makes this data interesting is not only storing it because the problem is humans are not so good in processing tons of data, but it becomes interesting once you can actually process this data. And Especially with machine learning, this is becoming more and more possible to go through these huge piles of data. Okay, so let's have a look at the example again. So as we see now, we are not in the car anymore, but we have some kind of an aerial view. And this is we get data from all the different cars that we have driving around. And we can do nice things in there. So as we'll see when the stream starts, 
So now we can observe many more cars, we can predict all the way, and it's quite nice. So for the application of doing autonomous driving, it's very good. The more we know of the relevant world for us, the better our algorithms are, the better the things we can do there. Okay. So data with somebody else and data processing somebody somewhere else, good thing. Okay, then what we can do is we can feed the data back to the cars, also a good idea, because then the cars can drive around and they can not only see what they can actually see, but they can see, can see like what everybody else can see. So it's a little bit like, like the Borg in the TV series. So all the cars are like one system and they see what everybody else sees, which is good because then they can take care of that. Okay, good. Cars arriving, has lots of data, good thing. And here we also see that it goes no far also beyond the vision of what we've seen before. Okay, so now we have this picture and where do I see problems? So you already heard it when I was talking. So I see problems here, first of all, it's not switching. Okay, let's go here. Yeah. Okay, so first of all here, namely that somebody else has the data because then they can in the future do whatever they want to do with this data. And second, here, because the processing is highly critical. Okay, and why is it critical? Well, let's have a look at a system we know that stores lots of data, which is this ecosystem here. And what happens in this ecosystem? Well, we have people, our friends, putting something on this social network, and they're putting information of us in this network. And with this information, when, you, when we evaluate it, we can find lots of different information of us. So you might have heard of these filter bubbles that give you um, specialized ads that are just customized for you and so on. So we get lots of information here. Okay, so this might be problematic. The point that I want to make here is the, th the entities that collect the data are your friends or you yourself. So you're putting that on the network. Okay, when we switch now to the systems that we've seen before, it's not people anymore that put it on the network, but it's machines, it's sensors. And these sensors are, first of all, many more than we had before. And second, they are neutral and producing the data that they're able to produce. So, the, so there's no human bias in between the production of this data. And so this is important because it's more detailed and also more accurate data about us. So this is data collection. And so as already spoiled before, it becomes interesting when we add the machine learning or the artificial intelligence because this allows us to make use or get understanding of this data. And then it becomes critical. Okay, but how and why? Well, let's come back to the picture here again. What can we do now? So we can also give the data to someone else. Why not? Because the owner of the data is now here. And that this one here happens is not of our consent here because we gave the data here and then the data is just going somewhere else. So we put it out of our management zone so someone else is managing it. Okay, who could be this someone else? It could be the state for instance. Okay, so he has a negative image but it can also be positive of course. And here I see another problem which is again the processing of the data and here I want to show you like what can happen there. And I will present some examples that are mostly from China. And the reason that they are from China is that China is much further in using the technology that is available because they don't have to care so much about the inhabitants of their country. So they can just enforce that this and that happens. But it's a good example to show where we could also be developing and where we have to be sensitive to see that this is not happening. Okay. So what could happen there if someone gets the data? So this is not a car, this is just an entry fence there of a building, but what we see here is that this person is going there, is getting face scanned, and then here we see some people in an office, and 
I like that they put this picture here because it shows that there's something happening out in the world and then there's an office where people that have no relation to the reality out there in the world in the sense that they are sitting next to the fence, they're getting the data and they're doing something with the data. So you also might have heard about these people having to look at the Facebook videos to flag them if they are okay for Facebook or not. Horrible job. I would never want to have this job. But this one shows the people doing something with the data manually, like checking who was that entering the building. They are not related closely to this and the person going through the fence was also not aware that the data center is behind and checking everything this person was doing. Okay, coming to the car again. So this is a camera that is watching a crossing also in China and uh, it comes again later. So what we see here is that they do image recognition and they immediately and I mean this might be okay for like if you are a criminal and you're getting tracked there but the bad thing is they're doing it for everybody and as storage is extremely cheap you can be sure that they will just store everything because why shouldn't they and then when you commit a crime or they want you to, to they want to take you out of some things like you want to go for a political things or whatever then they could just use this material later and this is problematic okay so let's look at a, at a good example and look at what the pitfalls of the algorithm are so it seems that in, uh, in China there's a big problem with jaywalkers so with people walking over a red traffic light at the crossing so pedestrians walking over even though it's red and so they spend lots of energy in preventing that and also use threat things namely they put cameras they do image recognition and then you get negative points if you're recognized and you might have heard it in the news it was like I think like half a year ago or one year ago there's this woman here, and she's apparently a famous businesswoman in China, and she's part of an ad on a bus. So her picture here is on the ad on the bus. And so she got then a negative scoring because the cameras were always recognizing her. And so there, there you see the big pitfall. It's like, okay, they did the algorithm, they might have had best intentions, but it had problems. And so, I mean, for her it was probably easy because she's high in the social setting there so she could do something against. But it's easy to trap such algorithms. Also, you know from the Tesla cars where there were recent publications where they put some stripes on the ground to deviate them and so on. And so this is always something that you have to take, keep in mind when you create algorithms. It's very difficult to get fault-proof algorithms. Okay. So this is the, the driver again. and. Uh, yeah, so what, what you could do there, I said it before already, so you could do whatever you want. You could do surveillance 24-7 with the driver here because the data is actually not evaluated in the car, but it's sent back to the data center. And it's in this case even sent back to the employer of this driver. And so if he does something that he should not do, he gets something like an SMS that tells him like, okay, don't do that. You got now three points already. If you have five, you're out of the business. And there are many, many more applications what you can do there. And so this was just from a fair where they demonstrated some of the technologies that you can have there um, to do something. And the video from the Washington Post here is ending with that you can also use it, of course, in a negative way. If you have people that you think are against your current political streams, then you can easily prosecute them and um, totally mass survey them and can follow them on the street. So this is what we've seen before there as well. And so therefore this article here is also called Democracy Dies in the Darkness. Okay, good. Social score system in China, probably you also heard about that. So China is completely surveying the people there and based on what you do, you get some scores. You can even watch them in an app as I, before I understood this. And if you have a high score, everything is good. But if your score gets low, then you have a problem. Okay, so all your actions are monitored. They are evaluated through algorithms. Then you're scored through algorithms here. And in the end, you get punishment. So if your score is too low, you are not allowed to fly anymore. You're not allowed to get credit for buying something and so on. And this is where it could go. And as technology developers here, we should be aware of that. And we, should, we are responsible for preventing that. And if we say now, okay, so this is China, so uh, we are far away from that. I also brought you a video from Berlin. So this was um, already in 2018. 
at the Berlin Südkreuz, which is a crossing for the trains there. And there, this is a demonstration by the police, there you see exactly such a system. I mean, this is just a demonstration, as you can see, because nobody would look like in the camera that straight. Um, but anyways, they are testing the technology. And so we as a society have to be aware of that, and we have to intervene if we don't want to have such things happening. And if we are creating the algorithms, if our employers are asking us to create such critical algorithms, we have to ask back, and we have to make sure that we are ethically okay with what we are doing there. And this is our responsibility. To put it with a, motto, with a former motto of a company, we should try not to be evil. And what does that mean in that case? Well, it means if something happens that we find ethically not okay, we should not be silent, we should act. We should do something against. And this is, by the way, also something that uh, Martin Hellman was talking about in his talk, um, that you should always do ethical decisions, no matter how unimportant your decision is, because then you are trained in doing ethical decisions. Because then when it comes to the big cases, when you, you have to implement the social scoring system, then you're already trained in taking ethical decisions and being sensitive on what could be critical there. And then you can apply better your knowledge of doing things in a certain way. Okay. I do not want to close negative. I want to close positive. And therefore, here we have an example of the Tesla again. And we have the autopilot here running. And what we'll see in the video is how the autopilot does something that we as human might not have done that good. Namely, you will see that the car from the right here is now coming to the left unexpectedly. And the car will be steer out, but will not ram this thing on the left here. And then it will go back. And this is nicely showing how good it is to have these algorithms. OK. Yeah, it was, was, was quite nice. So probably a, a human driver would have just hit the fence here and destroyed the car. It seems that nothing happened with this car. So very good example. And uh, yeah, that brings me to the end of my talk. Here's the main picture again. Thank you for your attention. Your turn now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. What, what would you, I, the country, sorry. Ah, yeah. Oh, this is a, this is a. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is an interesting uh, philosophical question in the sense that, I mean, you don't have to go that far. You can also go to Japan, for instance, and work at the, look at the work ethics there. So there, it's apparently a good thing to be there before your employer, and or like it was, and it still is in many companies, to be there before your employer and to stay until very late and to, to spend your entire life at work and then die there with a heart attack. So this seems to be like the ideal way. And so, um, I mean, I, ca I can obviously not say anything to if, if China would work uh, better without these systems. So I think for the current system we have in China, these systems are perfect because they want to know everything about the people and then they want to um, intimidate them by knowing that the systems are happening. So this is also, uh, thank you for asking it by the way, because the, this is also a very important point that I might not have made totally clear there. So the problem is not necessarily that these algorithms are running perfectly and tracking you down perfectly. The problem is already when you know that these algorithms are running because knowing that everything that you do is always judged and could be negative for you prevents you from doing certain things. So it just cuts down your freedom. And so I think this is something that is in the interest of China that the people there or of any totalitarian regime there, that the people are somehow in the box where they should be and they do not break out of this box. But, but uh, wasn't about the government and wasn't about society. Mm -hmm. And this, this for the society, I would say that um, the people there are probably at the moment used to this system, and therefore it's um, 
it's okay for them that it is like that. And at the same time, the, the question somehow for me goes back to this question like, would you be more happy living in China or would you be more happy living in Germany? And this, you can break this question even more down saying like, are you more happy being employed by someone or would you like to be the boss? Then many people would say, okay, I would like to be the boss. But once they are the boss, then they see, okay, there's lots of freedoms and responsibility. And they think like, okay, it was much nicer in the box. And so this would be my answer. So if, you, if you're happy with the box, then it's probably okay because it makes the things more predictable. You know, everybody is hopefully, even though I even doubt that, equally treated. And then afterwards it's like, okay, the rules are clear. The rules are prosecuted. And so everybody has to follow the rules. There's less uncertainty. And the other systems have more uncertainty, but at the same time, more freedom to creatively do something. And so I would say, so I mean, I personally like that in Germany, we have like some clear rules, but we also have like still lots of freedom. And so for me, this works at the moment best, even though I would expect that when I move to China, probably all of us could also accommodate with it and it will probably appear for the person, for the people, much worse like from the outside because I come from another system and when I would move there, then it would probably be more normal for me. But my fundamental critics on that it's limiting your freedom are still remaining because I think your freedom is limited there, even though you might still be happy to live there. And it's also getting limited in Germany. And so this is why I also always want to make this point that like, even though this is an extreme that we most likely will never have or hopefully will never have, there are tendencies coming closer towards us and we as a society have to define what we want. And when we as society come in the dialogue to the decision that we want to have such systems, then I'm also okay that we have it. But my point is that we do not have enough, enough discussion about that at the moment. And therefore I want that people are aware of it, that they make deliberate choices and if their choice is then okay, the majority in the democratic Germany wants to have such surveillance because it protects the people like we have it with the, with the telecommunication surveillance in Germany or now this internet things that are happening more and more. If it makes lots of people happy and they want to have that and they do not need the freedom, then it's okay. It's, it's the decision of everybody. Oh. Another question? Can you, uh, can you hold on one second? You'll get the mic. The mic is coming toward you. Mm -hmm. Also very, very... Yeah, that's, that's also a very good question. So what, what I always also love to tell people is like, okay, you bought your spying device for $1,200 here and you have it in your pocket. It's always on and it's listening to you. So if you have seen the Google Keynote, so they now have the smarter algorithms that are even running on your phone. Or if you have the Echo, you might have... Might have um, might have heard that they are recording everything that is said there and then they're evaluating it, they're even storing it forever. There was just this news about the child devices that you have there. Um, should we stop using them? So my answer to that is typically, um, of course you can stop using it, but um, I would not do it because I mean, I also have a smartphone. I mean, I don't have a smart assistant at home, but if I would have one, I would probably also get used to that. Um, my, my point is more in that direction that you should be aware of that this data is getting collected so that when someone wants to use it later against you, you're not surprised about it. So there, to, to, to explain it a bit more, so you might have remembered the, the Snowden revelations. And so one of my, the attacks that I found most threatening is that the, on the network chips, there's a possibility to replay network traffic that comes then from your computer. And the attack scenario is now as follows. So people want to get rid of you. And what they do is they replay through your computer that you are accessing child pornography in Germany, for instance. Okay, this is forbidden for like very good reasons. And what they then do is like they make the German police find that and then the police will find out, okay, Mark was accessing child pornography, so we should put him to jail for good reasons. And then it's very hard for you as a person to make them understand or believe that you did not access it, but only your computer accessed it. And so 
there it's like, okay, when you're aware of that your computer could have done it without you, then you might react a little different than from when they accuse you in that direction. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't like fully answer your question, of course, but um, I would say I am pro the progress of these systems and therefore um, we have to tolerate that it's happening because otherwise we could not we could not develop this technology and we could not use it. And I would be happy if the people would be made more aware of what is happening with their data, who's getting the data, so that they can at least know it and ideally also decide about it. So here are two questions. So we'll yeah. I have a here. I Just wait for the microphone, I guess. The mic here. Yes. Very, very good remark. And so in that direction, I would love that even more people know about these alternatives because there's also like the signal messenger, with messenger which seems to be quite secure, but it's at the same time a little bit cumbersome in the usage, but would still be okay. But still in Germany, at least most people are using WhatsApp because it's just convenient. And so this is, this is a very good comment because we need more companies that are seeing this use case and then providing some service to even if, if the original company is not providing the service, making it sure for the customers that they can still get it to a certain extent. Very, very good remark. Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to mention a little bit about your last video about the replay of the, of the mm -hmm. scenario. So it might be that uh, there's a little bit um, of need to differentiate a little bit closely between uh, liability, mm -hmm. ownership and property, mm -hmm. and usage. Mm -hmm. Which does not mean if you are the owner of um, of an asset, for example, if you replace some sort of things on this asset, that um, you should be claiming to be some some somebody else. Mm -hmm. So the later the later thing must be done to reuse it, and not to the cost. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. But the problem I see is that the legislation and the judges that are then judging about it do not not have enough technical expertise to differentiate there because for them this is beyond the reality that this could happen. Yeah, but this is something what we should ensure innovation mm -hmm. technology that is that we get there um at least proof of liability mm -hmm. that should be mm -hmm. added to the fully agree. Fu fully agree and this is also something where we if we have more technical knowledge should push the people that are then deciding for instance about if we are guilty or not so that they also have this knowledge so that we should try to inform the others on okay this is the technology and this is possible and this is exactly this societal dialogue that i still miss too much that the people are like i don't understand it or i don't want to know because it doesn't affect me so for example another use case would be if you have for example a car and you have sensor on the it was a little bit of and let me say a misfunction with the sensor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I want to hack the data, mm -hmm. bring in data which are really uh, intended to, to fake the sensor and the, the whole function of the car. Mm -hmm. This is another use case. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, good. very, very good remark. Good yeah. remark. So I have one last question. Uh, sure, yes, we'll, we'll start with that. The same problem also apply to the data collected by those autonomous vehicles. Thanks for, for those uh, vehicles. You probably need the data in order to improve the spatial mm -hmm. functionality. So mm -hmm. there, there must be some sort of trade off between mm -hmm. privacy and, mm -hmm. and the spatial functionality. Yeah. 
so this is also a, a very good remark because um, this we also had a little bit in the other questions. So it's like to offer the service, you inherently have to collect the data. And therefore, so this was also especially in your question. So it's inherent to the service to collect the data. So if, mm. I, want, if I wanted to do s f speech recognition to a good level, I had to send it in the cloud so far. So mm. now with the new Google stuff, it might be that it works more on the device as well, but you had to do that. And therefore it's also like, like your remark was a little bit that the people then getting the data should, to, in my opinion, be forced to also exactly define what happens with the data, when is mm. it deleted, so that it does not happen what I showed here, that then bypassing you, the data is sent to someone else. And this bypassing must not necessarily be that, okay, um, I was selling the data, but it could also be that someone is hacking into the data center. Mm. And if the data is still there because you just wanted to have it for future use, someone could still like attack it and get then access to the data. So it's, it's, I mean, we can also look at, look at your question from the perspective of GDPR. So there, there are two terms defined in GDPR, personal data and personally identifiable data. Personally identifiable data is a subset of the personal data. So personal data could be anything. It could be your uh, tire profile or your gasoline level because anything that can be really can be related to a person. But personally identifiable data is, some, uh, is, is, the, is the kind of a data that can triangulate an individual behind the data. Now, GDPR says Personal, da personal data has to be uh, falls under, falls under a GDPR. So anything that relates to the car can fall under the, the GDPR uh, rest restriction. But that, is that practical? Is that, does that make sense is another question. Is that, is, is, will, it, will it really happen? We haven't seen the application of these laws in automotive industry. Is automotive industry immune to this or should they, should they comply to this? Or is it possible to comply to this? We'll have to wait and see. Plus, it's also that the boundary between these two types of data is like not fixed, it's floating. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. again, you see yeah. like the right. technological advance. So yeah. you have some pulse meters like the smartwatches here, and then you might have still unique patterns on your yeah. identifiable, and no one's thought about that before. Yeah. And so this, is, this again makes it more tricky. And so this is why I always see this twist between laws in Germany and technological development. And it's, 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 I would not even call it an arms race because mm -hmm. they are not at the same level. Mm -hmm. But like the law is typically mm -hmm. lacking behind and then sometimes even starting to prevent technological advance when the people then start saying like, okay, we should rather be yeah. in Silicon Valley. Oh, for the interest of time, we'll take one last question. And uh, yeah, continue, please. So um, um, I will um, mention this trade-off um, question. So um, I guess it's very important in this case that we do have a classification of data. Means what is it worth for me that some data of me is provided for a certain service I want to use or I don't want to use? Mm -hmm. But in this case, I have really the difference between personal, personal identifier data, and business data, which is data which I'm, I want to pay my service for. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I have always to do the classification in before. And at the moment, we do not do this classification in before. Mm. This means the data is unclassified when it's processed. And this is the problem it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Plus, I would extend the dimension a little bit by saying um, sometimes it's good to have data because you don't know the future use cases. Mm. And this makes this choice even more complicated. Um, plus, it, it will be complicated anyways. Because if I think about it, I have a list of 20 to 200 apps, and I have to decide for each app if it does something or not, which could be a sub-process in the autonomous driving, mm. um, it will be very difficult even for technological experts. But yeah. If we have any other questions, we'll take it to the panel discussion, because we're uh, actually um, you're a bit behind schedule. But thanks a lot for the lots of questions and discussions, yeah. because this is exactly the format. Yeah. So thank you, Mark. So I will switch. Oh, which which one? Okay. Ah, right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I promise. So I wanted to introduce Hassan. So yeah, as Hassan said already, so I know him since uh, 2008, and he's always been a very good friend. It was always a pleasure to spend time with him. 
And uh, when Hassan then finished his PhD, he did not continue in academia like I did, but he did something, namely funding a very successful company, which is the one that is also co-organizing this event today, namely Matrix. And it's a company specialized in automotive, automotive software and security. And Hassan has more than 11 years of experience in the automotive industry. He's a computer scientist and he's specialized in embedded security and machine learning. So CEO of Matrix, thank the stage you. is yours. Thank you, Mark. All right, so I will, thank you so much. So I'll try to make my part of the talk mercifully short because we uh, somehow are lagging. But before I start, since we were talking about GDPR, um, since this, uh, this, this, this event is uh, live televised and it was announced, by participating here, you're actually agreeing to the GDPR. So I, I'm obliged to mention it one more time. If one of you do, do not want your pictures or video to be uh, in the social media, please tell us, we'll explicitly take care of that. If you do not explicitly tell us, there was one, one lady who explicitly told me, so we will take care of that. If you do not explicitly tell us, you're actually giving us the consent to put it in social media. Having said that, um, all right. So I will have to think that the in is it working? Mark, I think oh, it's working now. It's working now. Perfect. So um, yeah, the agenda is I'm going to talk about uh, three things. I'm going to talk about the automotive security, where do we stand now, the challenges we have, the approaches that we're taking, and talk a little bit about future outlook although when we talk about future we're always wrong and I'm gonna be wrong but still I'm gonna talk a little bit how the future I think will look like so I'll start with a very different area so in 2017 you'll this Israeli author published a book called Homodios. The word Homodios means um, man god. This is the Latin for, uh, for, for, for superhuman, man god. So his thesis, the thesis of the entire book is with genetic engineering and all the advancement in technologies, we human will become, will, will evolve to be superhuman. And we'll look back in time, and people will, uh, people uh, 100 years from now will look at us and think that those people back then were a bunch of Neanderthals. Is there is obviously a chapter on the ethical issues of such practices, and here he mentions a very interesting story: the first child ever in the history of mankind born in Michigan in 2002 who had three biological parents. The motivation was she was carrying a genetic disease with replacing a part of her DNA with another healthy person she could be cured from the disease. Immediately in the United States it rose a lot of controversy and this practice, such practice was banned in the United States in 2002. Ten years later, one decade later, in 2012, the legislators in the United Kingdom legalized such practice. The point Yuval Noah Harari is trying to make is even if we want to stop it, even if we do not find it ethical, there is no way to stop it. If our country says this, this, is, this is illegal here, maybe our neighboring country will. If we all stop it here in Europe, maybe North Korea will uh, uh, take, take such approach and go ahead with time. So what he's saying is there is no break. There is no way we can stop it. The reason I'm saying is whenever I talk about security, we focus more on should we do this? Should we open up the OBD2 port to let innovation happen? The point is, it's going to happen anyway. There is the point to, to discuss should we do this and should we not is actually not that useful. Uh, rather, I would, uh, I would prepare, I would, I, would, I would go for the discussions how can we prepare and take advantage of the situation and come up with a solution to solve such problem. So now, automotive security, where do we stand today? I'm going to teach you. 15 years back in time, when I was still a researcher, uh, researching on the security topics, and uh, here is a screenshot of my Facebook profile uh, from 2007. So this is 
a feature back then in Facebook. Obviously, this, now it's much more sophisticated. We've solved this problem. What you could do is you could give Facebook your username and password uh, of your Gmail account, GMX account, web.d account, Yahoo account, Hotmail account, and whatnot to import your buddy list from them. So imagine what's happening in the background. You're literally giving your username and password to uh, Facebook, and they're impersonating you to get your data. Now, we've solved this problem. We have invented protocols like OAuth, OpenID, and these things doesn't happen anymore. You have a user consent, and your username and password is not given to the third party. Uh, so, so single sign-on protocols, cross-domain single sign-on protocols like SAML have solved this problem. Now, if I look at automotive industry, we're exactly 13 years behind. We have one ECU talking to another ECU, uh, one OEM or tier one developing their proprietary protocol to uh, do their challenge response. The other one is using other kind of uh, proprietary challenge response protocol. So there is no standard. AutoZar defines the interfaces for uh, your uh, AutoZar crypto service manager, defines the, defines the interfaces to talk to uh, your crypto interfaces. However, there is no protocol defined for our challenge response or handshake protocols. So that reminds me, history repeats. And if we look at this picture, it's not the technology. It's really not the technology. It's the user awareness. How many people were aware of what was happening? Forget about my mother or my grandma, who, who will never understand this, but even computer science students, engineers, it, this happened at a massive scale. Hundreds of millions of people actually compromised their username and password to Facebook. And if I look at, again, history repeats, if I look at automotive industry now, and if I look at this picture, and we, when, when massively people talk about autonomous vehicle, the user awareness, what is this technology, what this technology can do, is massively, massively lacking. Now, I'm going to show you a clip. Enjoy that, and we'll be back. Wait a second. The sound. Hmm. Mark, I need your help, I guess. Is it turned on? The audio. So you have to, you have to tell it and it should use the HDMI output. If not, you can It's using the HDMI output because I don't hear anything here. Is it on? It should be on, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, now it's not even uh, even displaying. No, well, it should come again. Okay. I'm sorry for the technical problem. But you you sure that it's going over the HDMI? If it is not going into it, I would I would have heard it right here. Function, you have to put the function. No, I was just checking if the is getting louder or not. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. What did I do again?
OK, so I'll stop there. So now I have to ask you questions. How many of you think that this is possible today? Great. How many of you think it's not possible today? All right, now, let's, let's have, have a look at the, the reality. We, we remember three years ago what happened in Berlin. It's not very different from them, so, so some, uh, different from what's, what is happening. Someone was physically driving a car in a Berlin Christmas market and attacking the, the regular people, right? Now, if um, that person could have done it remotely, that would have been uh, taken this uh, such kind of attack to another dimension. Now, I understand those of you who are thinking it's not possible. Now, let's look at some real life scenarios. What can actually be done today? What has already happened? So we'll start with relatively benign scenarios. So this was, uh, this was, a, this was a vulnerability that was, in, uh, that was invented by ADAC. So what they found is uh, four, 123,000 BMW cars, BMW Mini and Rolls Royce were affected since 2010. So what they, they had is you could, you, you could actually uh, access your vehicle through the BMW uh, drive, uh, Connected Drive app uh, and all you had to do is steal the VIN. So now, how many of you have security background here? Okay, it's very easy for you. How many of you do not have any security background? So I'm asking you guys, what do you think? Because you don't really need any security background to find out or you know, what happened or you know, it, to, to crack this. So what do you think could have possibly happened? Now let me tell you the protocol. So what you do is be able, you, you register your car, uh, an app or uh, your, your, your key fob uh, to the back end of BMW and you have a VIN, vehicle in, in, in identification number. And with that VIN you can, you can um, uh, register your car, and then you can change the settings of your car. You can uh, open the window, you can start the car, you can t uh, change the temperature remotely, right? So anybody who can have access to your VIN actually can do that. Now, what they did is the following. They used an HTTP GET to, uh, get, uh, to, to communicate with, uh, with the modem. So now, do you want where the vulnerability is? Those who do not have any security background, especially, HTTP GET. It's not encrypted, it's not HTTPS, it's HTTP GET, yeah? So it's so simple. And this was, um, this was a patch was uh, over there, update was sent by BMW, this problem was, uh, was solved. So this is one, this is relatively benign, but this happened. Let's look at another one. This is the Audi garage scenario. Yeah, uh, so they could inject malware when your car was taken for repair or anything and was connected to the computer of a, work, uh, a workstation. So you could literally inject a malware and the, you, you, the, your bootloader would, uh, would, would, would uh, start that malware and you could do anything you wanted to. It, the, it, similar to the 1,000 zombie cars we have uh, seen in our example. So you can make cars zombie. Third example, the, again, all these things actually, these, these attacks did not take in a malicious settings. It was uh, discovered in the lab. So good news, nothing happened. So this is another one, uh, the, a Chrysler Jeep that was, um, that was uh, uh, hacked by two um, researchers. And you could take control of the, the vehicle remotely. You can take control of the, of the brake, uh, tempering a GPS signal in the CAN bus. So if this could happen, what we have seen in the film can theoretically happen already today. So these are the so three, three examples that we've seen. Now, I'll go one step, for, uh, one step forward. So when it comes to uh, security vulnerabilities, there are four kinds of consequences. There can be operational consequences, there can be safety consequences, there can be privacy cons consequences like Mark talked about, and there can be obviously financial consequences. The three scenarios that we've seen, the first one goes mostly to financial and operational consequences, and this, uh, the second and the third one can have uh, safety consequences too. And obviously the first one has also privacy consequences. Now, um, 
where are we going with this? What is the current status of automotive security today? Uh, the good news is we are, um, we are waiting for a standard to come out, ISO 21434, the Road Vehicle Cybersecurity Engineering Standard. That, is, that was supposed to be released this year. It has been delayed uh, into 2020, beginning 2020. We are expecting a release of that. So what does that, what does that standard give us? Does it help us? Does it, does it make our life difficult? What does the standard give us? So I'm gonna give you a very quick overview of the standard. So the input of this standard was J3061. This is a document that is already available. You can go and have a look. This was a guideline. This was not a standard from SAE. This was a guideline for cybersecurity. So the, uh, SAE and ISO sat down together and took this, this guideline as an input and started developing the standard. So the standard has several different areas they focus on. They would focus on processes. So we are familiar with the V model, the, the uh, A SPICE V model and the ISO 2662 V model. So uh, ISO 2144 takes a similar approach of uh, defining a V model where on the left hand side of the V model, you define the, um, the security goals, the security architecture, you do a threat analysis, threat and risk analysis uh, on the architectural level and at the implementation level, you do a VARA of vulnerability and risk analysis, and the right side is for your testing. So processes, and it, 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 it focuses also on risks. How do you, how the OEMs, they, they are aware OEMs and the tier ones, they know what risk are they taking. So they use these two approaches of TARA and VARA for uh, risk analysis. They also lay a foundation for cybersecurity engineering. I have to tell you, they don't specify any security mechanism. It is up to you to choose the security mechanism you want, want to deploy. They give you a roadmap that what are the security uh, engineering requirements are there. They also give you a management uh, guideline of cybersecurity, a management, what are the, the way you should manage your cybersecurity in your, within your company. And finally, they give you a security testing mechanism. Now, as I promised in the, in the beginning of my talk that I'm gonna also look at the future outlook, because this is really, uh, like I said, I will be wrong. When I talk about the future, I'll definitely be wrong. So let me be wrong and talk about the future. So, uh, <laughs> So whenever we talk about the future, we have to look at the past. If we look at last 20 years, what we have seen is unprecedented changes of technology. However, we haven't changed that much of a rapid uh, uh, changes in automotive industry. Now my bet is we're at, a, at a, we're at the dawn of an era that in the next 20 years, we'll see unprecedented changes in our vehicles. And the changes, the problem is, we have seen in the past from IT, from, from the internet, from the cell phone industry, the changes of innovation is always faster, much faster paced than the security solutions. It's always like this. We move fast, we come up with features, we come up with cool features, we ship them, and then we realize it's not secured and we think about the security. Here is the problem. In, 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 in autonomy, aut, 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 automotive, if you do not think about the security uh, before, you're actually risking your life. In the Facebook scenario, and if you do not design the security mechanism right from the beginning, you might end up losing your life. Now, uh, having said that, I believe security and safety, these two, will be the enabler of autonomous vehicle. Because if we cannot make it safe and secured, the, the vehicle will not be in the street. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be glad to take it. Mark. Um, thank you very much for the very nice um, talk. Do you think, uh, what do you think would be an incentive for people to pay for security? Do you think this incentive is needed? Or 
because when, when you think about the non-autonomous cars, I, I think not only on Facebook, but I think on um, sofortüberweisung.de, for instance, where mm. I give my banking account name and password plus 110 in order to do this, to make it cheap for some airline companies. So people are rather seeing security like, okay, it's good if I have it, but if it's cheaper, then I just give all this data. So do you need, there's a need for an incentive for people to see it, or would you say like, okay, that they know there might be a risk for the life will be sufficient for the companies to invest on that? Well, uh, very good question, Mark. Thank you for asking that. So we can actually have a look at the, the, the internet industry. What, 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 how did consumers behave? Did we pay for, did, did our consumers uh, pay for uh, security? In most of the cases, even we, we had, uh, 10 years ago, we had a hard time uh, making companies, big corporations, understanding the value of security, uh, the, the monetary value of security. So when we go to our customer and talk about security, it's not interesting. What we had to do is flip the, uh, flip the, the idea and say, this is risk management. We put a number and they were suddenly interested in that. Now. Uh, you, you can look at several aspects of, of, of security. Nobody has ever, in my opinion, paid to have more privacy. They don't, you know, people don't want to have privacy. I mean, they want to give away data. Now, for security, when it comes to, they, uh, security is comparable to, uh, uh, you know, safety, when, when, when the consequences of safety, uh, safety consequences. Uh, they, the, the consumers, in my opinion, would expect something built in. They wouldn't want to pay for this, but they would expect that is the basic. And that is also the idea of this, this, this standard, because right now the legislators have nothing to point toward, like ISO 26262, that you have to comply to this. So when the standard ISO 21434 comes into the market, then the legislators will have something to point toward, and there will be a minimal security already built in in all the vehicles. So simply has to be there. Simply has to be there. Uh, you wanted to ask a question? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, do people want to pay for safety is a good question. Um, maybe we ask from the past, when the safety belts were, the people not only didn't want to pay for the safety, but they objected to get the safety because they felt it would limit their freedom. Mm -hmm. So, I doubt. Uh, I, I agree with you 100% there. I agree with you 100%. So apparently we reached the limit of the university. The university limit. <laughs> so um, I have a little bit of a question on what you, what you um, said, that uh, safety and security uh, have to be looked in together to yeah. guarantee that later it will work um, for a certain manner for, for the people, yeah? So uh, from my experience from security especially, yeah. um, it was always easier to reach a certain level of security when you have standardized components or standardized solutions in here, and you reduce complexities. Mm -hmm. So what is necessary to get, let me say, a standard model in there, um, to get this a little, bit, a little bit more secure and easier to, to implement? Oh. So when you look at the ISO 2434, mm -hmm. yeah. it's only a regulation or it's a recommendation. They only says you have to do this and this. Right. But it will not say how you have to do this. It always says what, but not say how. Right. right. But if you later want to guarantee some, sign, uh, some sort of security in, mm -hmm. you need to have to develop solutions how you implement this. Right. <laughs> right. I, I mean, uh, there, there is, it's a very good question. It's a very good mm -hmm. remark. Mm -hmm. um, there is parallelly, uh, we are developing out, out of our, uh, our Autos yes. are uh, mm -hmm. crypto service manager, for example. So there, mm -hmm. there you can use the, the HSM. You can use an HSM interface to mm -hmm. use the crypto libraries uh, yeah. to implement your security. Yeah. So that is there. However, uh, a security expert would argue that crypt cryptography is not necessarily you know, the only part of security. I mean, they yeah, always sure lo look for back doors. Yeah, sure. yeah. So in this case, a reference model or something like this uh, will help uh, maybe to, to have a minimum baseline of security may be implemented, yeah? but this, this is a discussion which is still open, yeah? uh, because otherwise around everybody will do it, every vendor will do it how he likes to do it. Yeah? In this case, it will not interoperable again for a security uh, projection. Right. So in this case, uh, there must be an end-to-end -end security somehow, 
In this case, a really a, a design model or a recommendation as you did it before is very, very helpful to reduce complexities and to get a better security level. In there. Right. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with you. The, pro uh, the, the problem is, you know, um, the problem is we, we are now having this CAL defined from uh, ISO 2144, the uh, cybersecurity assurance level, which are equivalent of the ASIL levels. So uh, from that onward, you will, be, you will be able to, you will really say, okay, it's, let's put it this way, it's just not practical yes. uh, to say that I will secure it for every, every, every possible scenario. It's just not practical. Mm -hmm. So you will have to narrow down your scope, and the scopes will be defined by the CAL levels. Mm -hmm. And if it has safety consequences on those, all those, so sa safety comes first. That is, uh, that is the principle. And this is where we'll have to see, OK, this is what we have to uh, specify and the, uh, the other. Um, so speaking from the safety perspective of the security, um, we do need to change the vehicle architecture. So at the moment, we have everything connected to everything on a CAN bus, and everything can see everything, and everything can hack everything. So we have a massive threat vector there. So for me, it's about, as we've said, creating a reference architecture where we take away some of that burden from the individual sensors, the individual actuators, and say, OK, we're going to create a network which the network takes care of who can talk to who. It's the same as we have in the university networks, in our company networks. We have managed switches. We have, okay, wireless LAN as well, but if we have a physical LAN cable, the switch determines which port can talk to which other ports, and we can run multiple networks over the same copper because they're virtual private networks. And so I think this is the kind of thing we need to create in the vehicle. Then we free up the engineers working on the sensors and the actuators because they don't actually have to take care of it anymore. So I would, uh, to try and get an IT analogy, um, when you develop an app for a computer uh, today, uh, some of the things uh, you, you just could not take care of yourself. But you have a toolkit which you buy as an app developer which takes care of all that other stuff you don't want to worry about so you can focus on your creativity. And I think that's what we need to look for. But it needs, first of all, a reference architecture and some sort of standardization such that we actually have something we can work with. I mean, when we think back to the starts of computers, we had lots of different hardware. I remember SCSI. It wasn't compatible with anything. Uh, and you couldn't unplug it while you were using it. And now we've got USB-C, which can run two different protocols on the same physical connector. And I'm thinking, wow but yet still every new computer comes out with a new connector. So this is, this is not a, a quick solution. But I think if we create standards and people get behind those standards, like they did with USB, for a while like they did with Firewire, then uh, that's the kind of approach we need. We, we, need, to, we need to fire that on and, and, and uh, be, uh, to use the human analogy, we need, we need to enable the humans in the loop to be creative and not get bogged down uh, in, in some of the details, which I think they just can't, it's, it's too much to expect. I, I, I totally agree with Stephen, and to, to, to add something on top of uh, your remark, um, Stephen and I, we actually, we worked on a, on a publication, and we talked about the current vehicle architecture, which is wh where you have, uh, you may call it a universal CAN bus, your infotainment system and your braking system, yes, all actually going through a, a the same CAN bus, and this is this is why precisely the Chrysler hack could happen. And if you don't change the fundamental architecture, mm -hmm. no matter how much crypto you put, yes, there's exactly. always a risk. Exactly. So uh, I, I will go a stop uh, one step further in this case. Yeah. So because um, from a, from a, um, a information security or cybersecurity part of view, um, we had the same uh, paradigms. Means. Um, to have reference architectures, mm -hmm. and as well um, to have isolation and, uh, and redundancies, mm -hmm. uh, segregation, zoning, like s something like this. Mm -hmm. But in this case, especially in the car and the consequences, um, I guess it must be an integrated reference model for the safety and information security part. Um, otherwise around, it will be potentially not chained. And uh, as an attack vector, I would use exactly the interface in between. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the challenge we need to uh, face is that engineering good products is teamwork. And we've seen far too much uh, politics in organizations where we have the system engineers sitting in one building, the software engineers sitting in another building, and maybe the safety engineers sitting in a green hut in the car park, if they're lucky. And, and it's been very fragmented. Absolutely. And one of the things I try to focus on is that system engineering at system level, if we say system level is where we have hardware and software and some system architecture, at that system level, it cannot be done by the system requirements and analysts on their own or the system architects on their own, but a good system engineering requirement and a good system engineering architecture requires expert inputs from the lower levels, from the software engineers, from the hardware engineers, and we've added the safety engineers, now we need to add the security engineers. So when you said integrated um, reference architecture, not only do we need to integrate the architecture, we also need to reintegrate the humans to talk to each other, because that's the engineering challenge. So it's not we bolt on safety or we bolt on security. What we need to get back to is a team to design a product as a team, and a team understands that different expertise needs to be asked and given the opportunity to provide input, and the team together puts that into the product. Hmm. Um, from my uh, perspective, you need as well uh, some security governance, hmm. uh, sorry, security and safety governance um, as a total approach. Uh, with some sensors in between the certain steps you implemented. Right. Can we uh, take this discussion to the panel? We'll take one last question, and then we'll have a short break, and we'll set up the panel, and these interesting questions can actually go to the panel. Uh, you wanted to ask a question? Uh, could, could I just do a short comment? Yeah. Because what I wanted to say is, like, what do you have here? You have a system where all the apps are sandboxed. And so this is also an interesting approach, because this is then providing not enough, I would say, security by design privacy to a certain extent by design, and this could also be interesting for the automotive industry to go mm. into that. Right. You, you wanted to ask a question, right? Yeah. I mean, this, is, this will be the last question before the panel, but please, please hold on to your questions. We'll have a panel discussion, and you can ask, yeah, uh, take this interesting discussion yeah, there. Just regarding the remark that uh, an occurrence vehicle architecture, the infotainment system and the brakes are on the same canvas. Mm -hmm. Can you specify which vehicle this is because I don't want to buy it, and, uh, and, uh, and it's I don't really believe it because it's not really te technically possible that are on a current vehicle there are like 12 uh, separated CAN buses plus flex ray, plus MOS, plus e Ethernet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The problem is the intended function. So the intended function is we have a safety can and we have a non-safety can and we have mo and all these different things. So in the intended function, they're segregated. The problem is, in a particular vehicle that we're not going to name, uh, the engineer is someone, whether deliberate or unintentionally, had the great idea, maybe for maintenance, I forget what the exact motivation was, we need to access the safety can. So there was a physical connection there. Now, it was not part of the intended function. So normally, it's not a problem. For safety, it's not a problem because it's not active. If you talk to security, all you need is a connection or a connection you can turn on and suddenly you're in. And so my analogy, yes, those vehicles had a firewall, a gateway between the safety and the non-safety area. But there was a wire, I'm physically, I think that basically went around the firewall and the analogy would be back in Roman times that we would expect the Romans to build a fort and only put walls on three sides and be stupid enough to expect the Greeks to attack via the front door instead of coming in where there's no wall and I think this is the problem um, when uh, Mark mentioned the, uh, uh, the, the iPhone having the sandboxes that's great because that's the kind of thing we need but we need to validate that we haven't got a back door or uh, something that can be turned on, which basically... I was going to the automotive industry, worked in the aircraft industry, and now I'm with security issues uh, at Cyrus and 
There we are mostly working for, or in my department, we are working for better security for automotive, uh, for almost everything, but automotive is closely related to what I'm doing. So this Thank is where I'm coming from. It's very nice to join today because uh, the original plan uh, uh, panelist, the original plan panelist, uh, Mario Hoffman, from Continental fell ill and he couldn't join and I asked um, actually um, another colleague of mine, Siri, if uh, she would join and, and sh she recommended him. So thank you so much for joining. Yeah, so we'll take the first question that was from one of our um, um, you know, on online viewers. So uh, what's your view on PKI in automotive security? Who wants to take that? I can start with this because PKI starts very early in the process. So uh, even when you start to to test the cars, you should bring it already in. Um, you need for for a secure car, a secure development environment, and a secure production environment, and you can't start too early to bring in the security, and therefore you should already have the PKI ready when you uh, start testing the cars in the field. So this is one point. The other point is um, it's quite picky because um, the root uh, certification authorities need to be really safe there. We are talking about millions of cars and uh, from OEA most times this uh, root certification authorities and therefore it's essential to take care of of the keys there and I the OEMs already aware of how much work this will be for them. Right. Um, so what, what I can say is that uh, you can use the PKI approach also to um, define for instance to, to whom do you distribute data and to whom do you not distribute data by changing the approach a little a central certificate authority to work having distributed certificate authorities that might be even within the car then creating trust links between entities there and uh, so yeah I would say it's like uh, of course a promising approach for encrypting data that are stored somewhere and also for uh, um, transport security at least initially uh, negotiating then symmetric keys that you can use later and it's also very attractive so for proving the and the ownership of data to someone else and so therefore um, f from a general use case I like PKI very interesting and also like for the for the car use case of course so uh, Stephen do, uh, do you think um, such approaches that we just discussed will have some safety consequences if we can hack the car and cause injury it has a safety consequence. Short answer, unusual for me. <laughs> Any questions for the panelists? Yeah, the microphone has to stay here. You can go, I'll repeat the question. Wants to take that? You want to repeat the question? So the question was, um, do we have enough uh, processing power in the chips today in order to deal with security in automotive? Yeah. And from a safety perspective, I would, although we said earlier we want an integrated approach, integrated approach doesn't mean we have to do everything on one chip. So the complexity over the life cycle, I would actually like to see if we have a, uh, a control unit I would like to see a segregation between the system elements, hardware and software doing the cryptography, and the system elements performing the basic function and safety. Why? Because with the exception maybe of the autopilot and the sensor fusion, everything else is relatively simple. The amount of need to control 
an electric motor, or the, the traction motor isn't going to increase. Yeah, we, we, we're already there, so we don't need more power for that. So it would be nice if we could fix that for the lifetime of the vehicle, let's say 22 year life cycle, conservatively. So we want to fix that part of the product design so we don't have to keep recertifying the safety every time we have a security update, but enable maybe to update the hardware. Because if we look back 22 years ago, you did the Facebook, you only went back, I think, 14 years. But if we, could if we look at a typical vehicle life cycle for a product, five years of design, uh, sorry, two years of five years of manufacture, another 15 years in service, that's 22 years. And if we look at computers we had 22 years ago, when you talk about processing power, if we had a desktop computer 22 years ago, security colleagues will probably be able to confirm even better than I can. But as I understand it, with this mobile phone, we can crack that security by brute force attack in seconds. So my fear, or not my fear, my expectation maybe, is that whatever hardware encryption we put into the vehicle today, it will not survive the expected 22-year life cycle as a minimum that we have for everything else on the vehicle. So the conclusion I would have is we will need part of the security ticket, removable, upgradable, replaceable, but not have to replace the entire product every time, because let's face it, if you buy a premium vehicle, you don't want to replace 100 or 200 ECUs every second year just because of the security when everything else was still perfectly okay. So um, my, my first answer before Stephen was saying something would have been like, okay, you can uh, leave the ECU and add a coprocessor that is doing this cryptography. But uh, I mean, what you said is obviously um, the case because the, the cars are also not on the road for just one year like the smartphone. I mean, you throw the smartphone away when Apple, for instance, decides not to provide you a software update. So then they have gotten rid of the chip for the cars. You obviously don't. And so maybe one, uh, one kind of devices would be going into the direction of FPGAs where you have then general purpose gates that you can reprogram for these cryptographic functions and then you would have some kind of like hardware up adaptability um, even though you would not have to put it into the general purpose ECU co uh, processor that you have there. I think we need so many um, new chips and everything every year as you mentioned already that we can't go on with the architecture we have already. Um, if you're looking at cars, we are talking about more than 80 ECUs today. If you look at a helicopter, it's eight computers in there. Uh, the great benefit from bringing all together is that you don't have to use cryptography between the processes because they are on a secure platform already. Um, we need a security to secure the network platform underlying because uh, the network is more or less passive and uh, by that not really secure. So we have to build up the security for this first before we can go to the higher levels. And if we are reducing the number of computers, we are reducing the networks we have to secure. So I think we are completely different than we, we are doing today. But this will be hard for the OEMs to accept Let's see how long it takes. So yes, uh, one w one interesting point is, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, you will have to keep updating the software. You know, you have to send over there updates. You have to keep sending over there updates in order for security, to, you know, to ma maintain the security lifecycle, which is actually very non-traditional for automotive industry because once you certify. Uh, once you certify a, P a, a software, a, a, an ECU, you never touch it. But once you ship something over there up as an over there update, wh what, wh how would, it, wh would that happen? Is it certified? Is it still certified? Will, uh, will, should we bypass the certification mechanism? Steven, uh, do you want to say something about that? So with, as you said, with the current architecture, we'll be in an unaffordable, unachievable situation. Um, but if we can segregate the bits that need the over-the-air update, and I'm hoping the intended function needs an over-the-air update very seldomly, then we can say we can encapsulate the security away from the safety. So we can say that whatever we do with an over-the-air update in terms of the security algorithm itself doesn't cause an injury 
which is protected by the safety part. But that will only work if we've segregated. If we flash the entire ECU every time with the bootloader and all the code, including the security and the safety code, then it is absolutely clear we will have configurations out there in the field that have never been tested. Yeah, It takes years of testing to test a complete software. And even then, when you do the final tests, that's with a different software that the earlier tests were done. So obviously, we've got all the mathematicians that work out, is that enough coverage? And there's a bit of luck in there, and there's a bit of probability. And for safety, we can say at some point, that's safe enough. But clearly, we're not testing all the configurations we have now. So if we have to keep updating over the air different ECUs on a different day, I don't know how we keep that deterministic and how we show that it's safe enough. So the message is we need to change the architecture to not have that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good answer to, to add to that. So uh, as, as we also in the research come from the IoT environment, there it's even worse because everybody can bring in their own devices and connect them and they all have over-the-air update. And so that means you you really likely don't have two um, configurations that are alike. So with the car, I would say that it's even a little bit better because at least people are not daily plugging in new devices, but, st but still you have this issue. And so... Um, therefore, two things. So the, the first thing is you have to make sure that the thing is that is getting shipped is actually verified when it's there, so that it's clear, like no one messed with that, and also someone is liable for it. So you can identify the source, and then you can say that it's this big car manufacturer that was that is liable for what is happening with this update. And besides that, an interesting approach is this. Um, Using the cars then for also for continuous testing. So I was just talking to one of uh, one of my PhDs like um, t today, and was telling me about this. This uh, I think it was called dark mode with the Tesla, where they where they t continuously also test new functionality in the rolled out fleet. And um, maybe this is also something that has to become more normal that we have then this testing, but in a responsible way. So, of course, you cannot um, test a new braking system in a live productive car. I mean, it should be clear that this is not possible, but that we just cannot reach the state that you were saying that we can test everything in advance because the deployed configuration will be different and then we need new, new methodologies or new methods to, to test it in the field in a responsible way so that nothing happens. And the, the separation of the, of the um, functionality I think it's a good idea, but at the same time, I would say that it's very hard to say where you put the line. So what is the functionality that you are allowed to update and which is not? Still, it's good to differentiate. So to say the safety critical functionality can only be updated when the car is standing, for instance, or like when it's at the garage or something like that. Um, but still, I would say that the, the, the borders between these parts will be floating and therefore it will be difficult to define that. We could be really radical. We could say we want a design of the vehicle in future where some of the intended functionality is given complete freedom to do whatever it wants. In other words, we actually design a vehicle architecture where we say some of the intended functionality is what in the safety world we call QM. In other words, we just let it run riot. If it does something really bad, we have some envelope around it to prevent the bad things happening. So in that environment, we just don't care what the software configuration is. I mean, if they really mess it up, we'll have a lot of upset customers, but we won't have killed anybody or we won't have injured anybody. So, but this requires a whole new approach, how to create the layers of the onion such that, uh, for example, if we're looking at the use of AI to get a really nice smooth trajectory along the lane, that's fine. But maybe we need the edge detection, uh, which then at very last minute reacts very brutally to stop us then leaving the lane. Um, we don't care that that's very brutal and very uncomfortable because the assumption is it should hardly ever happen. But if the AI or whatever QM logic we're using in the middle does go wrong, then it will protect us. Uh, and this is the challenge. Can we segregate? between some of the intended functionality and keep that like in the middle and say performance and comfort and do everything we want, but then still define a boundary, which we don't normally go into in operational uh, circumstances, where we can then react and preferably that boundary is much simpler because we don't need it to do the normal function and therefore more secure and, and we just let the middle do whatever it wants. No, 
no, I'm not suggesting we don't need to update it, but the question is about the effort of verification and certification. In other words, if, if for all the things we want to play with, so for example, I mean, you mentioned about people configurations, but we've already got like the apps with CarPlay, where you can download a new app on your car. Tesla can beam onto your screen, hey, do you want to try out a beta software for the next three months? So we will actually get people wanting, I think, in future, just like on your mobile phone, to go to the app store, download an app, and try something out. But if we design the vehicle architecture, so that is like a safe play area, it's like the children's play area. You put you put the uh, either the sand there or you put the rubber matting and you have a gate around the outside so the child can be unsupervised for half an hour uh, and the parents just stand at the edge and make sure nobody leaves the fenced area. So for me, that would be the analogy. That doesn't mean we never have to repair the fence. What it means is when we repair the fence, we have to get a proper fencing person in. It's a lot of effort. It has a lot of verification, a lot of cost. But if we don't have to do it too often, the cost isn't such a problem. What we desperately need to avoid is having to do that cost for every little minor software update we do, which, to be blunt, doesn't need to have an impact on the safety. For example, you could make it that the update of the security and the safety envelope is only done by the OEM or an approved authority, but the customers can do the update over the air with their app so that they can live. It's, it's an... It's what, what it's an interesting approach uh, because we discussed this at the panel and at the Safe Tech conference also, and there were a lot of uh, safety people there, and we came to another approach because we we defined that the security has to take care of of every attacks, and the safety has to take care about not it, uh, not harming anyone. Mm -hmm. So the safety needs uh, this testing and everything and. Uh, the conclusion there was to to try to get this separate, and there is a big need for for the security back around all this to be updated very frequently. So um, the approach was to to have a system virtualized maybe uh, for the safety that has all the testing and all the approach. And uh, this is embedded in a secure environment, secure system uh, that can be updated more often. Then you can have the safety for a long time uh, without new deliveries. But of course, you have to, to guarantee the security functions and test them every time you deliver this. This is the, la the, the, the layered approach. Yeah. For the interest of time, I'll take one question from our uh, online audience. So the question is a little bit different. So would the security guideline be based on the precondition that security will always have um, a safety consequence? Uh, if so, how about uh, you know hacking an immobilizer, which, uh, which, which may have a lot of losses, and uh, what will be the secure state? What will be the definition of the secure state? I would say it's not necessarily only safety, it could also be privacy, for instance. <coughs> so when we think about the thing that I brought with the with the images of the drivers that were seen there, so uh, security is just like having someone doing something with the device that you didn't want to happen, and so remotely, and or especially remotely. I mean, it doesn't even have to be remotely, and so yeah. I think that's not true because security takes into account everything not only the safety, we are talking about uh, stealing the car already, but there's also all this um, functions in the car that might bring an OEM uh, su super superiority over his um, over, over the other OEM. So even there is something you have to protect and there is no uh, safety in the scenario. So safe uh, hacking is not 
a safety. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're way past our scheduled time. So, for the interest of time, we'll take one uh, last question. So, and then we will, uh, I mean, thanks so much for st st staying with us, bearing with us so long. One last question. Yes, please. So what, how, what, how do we deal with the legacy code when it comes to security? I would suggest from the safety perspective using the same approach we do with safety, which is we define the legacy code as being allowed to do bad things and we put the layer around it to prevent when the bad thing's happening, the consequence coming to fruition. So, for example, you define your legacy code for the intended function as QM, and you put a bolt on safety mechanism, which can be very simple, very rudimentary, because it's not needing to control anything, and therefore not actually very expensive. So it's definitely cheaper uh, to bolt on a simple mechanism than to go back and redesign all the old code. And I'm thinking maybe if we have the right architecture, the right engineering approach, um, that we can then uh, how should we say, uh, keep some code there uh, protected by the, other, by the other layers. It doesn't mean just because the code's old, it's necessarily insecure. So I, I find a good security model to always consider everything you can untrusted and also cope with it that way so that you only enable the things that you want to enable and the rest you just assume it's not sane, it's not doing what it's intended to do because this is the safest that you can do and so I would exactly go like you said, I would also like sandbox it and then open only the things, the functionalities that I intend to happen or even go a step further and if I don't want to change this code, model how it should behave and use that one for anomaly detection for what the entire module is then doing. I don't really agree with you there. Uh, safety can't be, security can't be built into the codes afterwards. So if you really want to be secure, and we have a problem here, because you can't really guarantee in automotive the safety of the car, uh, security of the car, everyone can approach a car parked at the street side. So we have a big issue here and to get this car really or to the electronic the system in there really uh, secure we have to to build it in the system from the beginning and this is the big issue our cars are kind of uh, secure at the moment uh, or at least don't harm too many people but i see a big issue here to where a lot of people can uh, get into the car. So I would say we should just keep them out of the internet and if we want a car that's co uh, connected to the internet, we should redesign from, from a scratch. The only way to get it really uh, secure. So but do you uh, advise your customers to uh, build the legacy code from scratch? Because if I, if I advise this to my customer, I lose my customers. <laughs> No, no, it works because I, I say this once and they just don't listen. <laughs> so the next sentence is, okay, if you don't want to do this, then let's see what we can do. <laughs> so, so I would say it's not necessarily contradictory because I also say like you cannot build in security afterwards. So you have to build it in the, to the core of the system because otherwise you can circumvent it. I totally agree with you with that. But the problem is the soon you have systems that are built out of components or modules and you I do not have control over these modules, then it's good to have a hybrid of both approaches. So to create everything under your own control, secure from design, and for the other ones to try to imply even additional security, even if they didn't take care of. I mean, the best situation is, of course, as you say, like when you can create everything anew, but sometimes I think you don't have the situation. And then the approaches we were talking about before can help you to at least ensure a certain level of mm -hmm. security, because in the end, when you put the module in the box and you control the interfaces between the inside and the outside, then it is as secure as you define the box. I agree, but I think it will not work because to, to really box the old software, you need a lot more power than the um, ECUs yeah. have today. Yeah. 
and they don't want to bring in the more power because it costs money. Um, so, so we are here in the catch-22. Um, but there is the possibility to build security from a from lot, uh, lot of modules, and it's a um, relatively old approach. It's the common criteria. They state how you can build a bigger system out of components and uh, conserve the security. I think we, we should go in this direction. We not only see the security of one module, but also define the environment it has to work in to be secure. And therefore, we can uh, create a bigger environment for the whole car and out of a lot of components. OK. OK, so uh, thank you so much. So uh, thanks. Yes. So because before concluding, so we are now like two meetups. And so um, if you're interested also in the other one, consider looking at the other meetup and also subscribing there, because in both meetups we'll have also like additional events that are joined probably because it was a very nice event but we'll also have separate events because we go